Hey everybody, welcome back to the homestead. Well, today we're gonna to give you guys a tour of our summer garden and show you how things are going. Uh, some things are going well, some things not so well, but we wanna show you a good picture of what's going on here on the homestead. Before we do that, we wanna give you a quick update on the progress of our daughter Grace and her healing following her accident. Late last week, she's actually doing really great Today she gets the staples removed from the deep laceration that she had on her head and uh, things are just, they're going really well. We're very pleased. Yeah, she's up and active and I mean not pushing it too hard but she's she's walking around. She's even come outside to you know spend some time with the animals and stuff so uh, we couldn't ask for better progress than how it's going. But today we're, it's all about the garden so let's go get started. Our first two rows here are cantaloupe and we've really reserved this kind of beginning third or 25% maybe of our garden for melons and we're trying two different kinds of cantaloupe and overall they're doing okay but they are really getting hit hard by the cucumber beetles and actually the squash bugs too which we actually didn't even think that squash bugs would be attracted to cantaloupe. That's probably just our ignorance and, and not researching it well. So a few days ago, probably three days ago, I came out with a bunch of diatomaceous earth and I sprinkled it on all of the cantaloupe plants and actually the watermelon plants. There's been a, a big decrease in both the cucumber beetles and the squash bugs, but they're not entirely gone. I'll probably have to put another application on there um, in the next couple of days and we're hoping for the best. I think in general at least half the plants will probably end up making it. It seems like there are some that I think we're still going to lose. Um, I know some people had questioned why we planted so many of these plants at the beginning of the season and this is exactly why. Uh, we knew that probably not all of them would survive and if we can just get some through uh, if, if we can get half of them to make it, we'll still have a nice harvest. So sometimes it's worth planting more than you need, uh, knowing that, you know, there's going to be a chance you lose some. And that's exactly what's happening here with these melons. Also, when I planted these seeds, I planted two seeds per hole, and I've let both of them grow. And in some cases, one of them has, one of the two on each little plant area has died but we're left with the other one. So I'm actually really happy that I didn't go through and you know, take off one of the two on each of the little um, areas. So we're hoping for the best. These are both heirloom variety uh, cantaloupes from Baker Creek that we're, we're testing out for the first time this year. Right, now if we end up having too much of a problem and uh, get a terrible harvest because of the bugs, uh, our plan is to research some hybrid varieties for next year and see if we can find something that may be a little more resistant to the bug damage. Um, but uh, we're going to give these a shot first. The next row in our garden is our watermelon and they're actually doing pretty well. Uh, we've also seen some of the cucumber beetles and squash bugs on them but not as many as the cantaloupe. Uh, in general I think they're growing better and faster than the cantaloupe are. Uh, but they still have a long way to go. Uh, I don't see any watermelons on them yet, but we're hopeful that they're going to do well and if we can get them kind of through this beginning part, once they get big, uh, I think they're going to do just fine. Next up are the pinto beans and they are just fantastic. They're growing really well. They're starting to uh, climb up the fence that we have here, which is exciting. Kevin and I have really only grown bush beans. Well, I guess one time we tried a pinto bean, but uh, this is really our first time that we're growing a lot of pinto beans and we're really excited about it. And uh, we're, we're happy that they're starting to grow up. And actually, they're starting to put on blossoms. I'm so excited. That means that food is coming soon. These are the tiger eye pinto beans from Baker Creek. They're just a, a beautiful bean and they're supposed to do really well for things that we love like refried beans. I'm excited about that. This year we're doing a whole 50 foot row. We'll see how much that 
produces for our family and if that is one year's worth. Um, if it's not quite one year, then next year we'll double it or whatever we think we need to do in order to produce one year's worth of pinto beans. Uh, but these are doing really well. And right next door to the pinto beans are all of our green beans. We have one and a half rows of green beans. They're the contender variety. We got these from Baker Creek. These are a bush variety, so this is kind of what we're used to, and they are just loaded with blossoms. I can't even believe it. You know, we've had a lot of things going on in the homestead, and, and you know, sometimes I, I've kind of gotten down because of uh, what's been going on with Grace, and to come out to the garden and see that life is coming and food is coming, it actually, it reminds me how faithful God is to us, that he will provide, that he hasn't forgotten about us. And to come out here and just see these blossoms, it just reminds me that he's taking care of us and I can just relax a little bit and continue to trust in him. So I know maybe that's a little bit deep for the green bean rows, but I actually had that, um, that kind of epiphany over the week that uh, we don't need to worry so much because God has it all in control. So we are excited to start producing beans on these plants, get them picked. This year I'm gonna be doing my dilly beans, which the family loves. I'm gonna do a bunch of them this year because we ran out, we ate them all up really fast. And then we're also gonna pressure can the green beans. We love green beans and we eat them all winter long. I'm almost out. so. We need to get, uh, they need to get producing so we can start restocking our supply. So next up is one of my favorite rows in the garden and that is our okra. Uh, this year we're doing two different time, two different varieties of okra. We're doing Eagle Pass, uh, which are these right here. We've started these from seed. Uh, they're taking a little bit longer. Uh, the Clemson Spineless we're doing down on the other end. That's a variety that we've done in the past. And those we actually started from transplant. So they're a little bit ahead. Uh, I've actually already been picking a few okra off of them and that's awesome. Uh, but I'm excited to try these. They're supposed to be uh, a little bit fatter and a little bit shorter of a pod, but they're supposed to stay uh, real nice and tender. So I'm excited to try those. Uh, they do seem like they're getting a little bit more bug damage than the Clemson Spineless were. And I'm not exactly sure why maybe because they're just still smaller uh, but it looks like they're doing well so a new plant that we're trying this year on just half of a row is a plant called sunberry or wonderberry they're supposed to be really good in pies and jams they're kind of like a huckleberry but the plants are just an annual so they'll just grow for one season produce a bunch of fruit and then be done and we'll have to replant next year the one downside that we've seen so far is that we didn't have very good germination with them I've done some reading since then, and I really think next year we should start them in the greenhouse and then move them out here as transplants. Uh, well, we, this year we just seeded them right into the ground and it doesn't seem like it worked well. The ones that did come up look like they're doing pretty well, but we probably only had about 50% germination. So next year we'll do them in the greenhouse and move them out here. But I'm excited to try them. Uh, we love to have more things like that, more berries around. Uh, just a nice uh, thing to have on the homestead. Now we're in between two aisles of my favorites to grow in the garden, and that is the peppers. The peppers are doing fantastic. I was a little worried about them going in because uh, we really did plant late this year because of all of the weather, but they are catching up. And I would say that every single pepper plant that we have is producing peppers. They're not quite as tall as our pepper plants last year, but I think that there is a lot of summer left and there's a lot of opportunity for them to grow tall and get nice and bushy and uh, produce a lot of peppers. Last year, we produced so many bell peppers that I actually still have a ton of them chopped up and diced in the freezer. So this year we don't need as many bell peppers, so that is an opportunity for us to sell quite a few of them at the farmer's market. But the spicy peppers and the new peppers that we have never grown, uh, we're excited to stock up our pantry and the canning shelf with them. This plant right here is an emerald giant bell pepper. This is actually my very favorite variety of bell pepper to grow. 
Um, I saved these seeds last year and it was a good thing because Baker Creek wasn't offering these seeds this year so I was able to plant some. I've never really planted and started seeds that I've collected myself so that was a new experience. I didn't isolate the pepper plants from one to the other last year so I guess it's kind of an experiment to see if these have cross-pollinated at all with the jalapenos that were right next to them. So we'll see if any of these end up being a little bit spicy. But I, they're still producing a ton of peppers on all of these plants. Shortly, we'll be able to start harvesting. So this row over here is primarily bell peppers. I have two different kinds of green, standard green bell peppers. Um, one that will go red fast and is a roasting pepper called Ajvarsky, but I also have an orange, a yellow, and a lilac. So I'm pretty excited about that and I think that will be attractive at the farmer's market. Uh, let's go over here into the next row so I can show you some of the other peppers that we have that are doing really well. We're starting out this row with Craig's Grande Jalapenos, which is my favorite variety of jalapenos. They just are super prolific and they produce a really nice big jalapeno pepper. Last year I grew the same number of plants that I'm growing this year and I had so many jalapeno peppers. I pickled them, I used them in our salsa, and then I let a bunch of them just stay and stay on the plant and go red and then I made a ton of sriracha sauce which is a sweet and su spicy sauce that is my absolute favorite and I think I ended up making about two years worth of sriracha. So super exciting. I'm glad to have them back in the garden. Next up are the hot wax peppers. I've never grown them before. I really like that type of pepper pickled and then have it on my uh, pizzas and on my sub sandwiches and just to eat. And they are doing spectacular. I actually have probably a dozen of them to harvest already. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited about those. Next up are the serrano peppers. Now we like a little bit of spice in our peppers but not like the super duper hot peppers. So serranos are really the hottest that we're going to go this year. These plants are off to a really good start. They have tons and tons of peppers started on them. I don't think there's going to be any shortage of hot serrano peppers this year. Let me tell you a quick story about serrano peppers. Several years ago when we were actually in our urban homestead in the Phoenix area, we grew serrano peppers in our garden and they produced, we had no idea how many peppers they were going to produce. They produced so many peppers that at the end of the season when it was time for us to, you know, harvest everything because it was just getting too hot there actually, we filled five five gallon buckets of serrano peppers and that was just a ton of serrano peppers. I pickled a bunch. We just used the last of those pickled peppers last year and our in our basement we strung them up on strings. We just had strings of serrano peppers drying all over our basement. It was ridiculous. So we may be able to run with them again this year. After that are banana peppers which look exactly like the hot wax, pep hot wax peppers but they are mild. And these are one of Samantha's favorites, our youngest daughter, and she loves them pickled. So I'm going to be pickling those along with, you know, separately the hot wax peppers, but they're doing really well. She's super excited about these. Then we have another new pepper that we're trying in the garden this year. It's called Nada Peño. It's actually a jalapeno that isn't spicy. We do like some spice on the homestead and we really wanted to try this. I think it's also going to be good at the farmer's market for our area. We're in an area of the country where people don't like a lot of spicy, spicy stuff, but they like the flavor of it. So I think it will be a good addition uh, to sell at the farmer's market. The rest of this row are just two more of our colored bells, the orange and the lilac. So now we're to my favorite part of the garden and probably everybody's favorite part of the garden, tomatoes. There's nothing better than a homegrown tomato. So this year we're doing quite a few different varieties of tomatoes. Some of our tried and true varieties that we do every single year. Our most standard tomato that we grow every single year is called Jetstar. 
that's what these plants are right here. Uh, the Jet Stars are just an awesome variety. They're a hybrid. They seem to be very disease resistant. The tomatoes themselves grow nice and big. They're a perfect size to slice for sandwiches. Uh, they're not quite as big as a beefsteak, but pretty darn close. This is also the variety that we use as our main tomato for canning things like diced tomatoes, uh, tomato juice, uh, all of those types of things. We use the Jet Star. Uh, this year, though, we're actually trying a second variety of slicing tomatoes that's supposed to be very similar to the Jet Star. It's called the Jet Setter, and it was highly recommended to us. They're down on the other end of this row. One thing that we've noticed with these Jet Setters versus the Jet Stars is that they seem to be getting some type of fungal something on the leaves. I don't know if it's blight or some other type of fungus. So yesterday we did have to uh, prune these pretty heavily, which you can see they're pretty bare right now, but we had to do that because there was quite a bit of fungus on them. Uh, we are going to be spraying with a natural antifungal spray uh, probably later tonight, uh, but uh, the tomatoes that are on there are looking really, really good. It'll just be a matter to see if this variety uh, makes it back into the garden next year. So far, like I said, the, the Jet Stars, they seem like they're just a little more resilient than the Jet Setters, but we're gonna give these a good try and see how they do this year. The second row of tomatoes that we have in our garden this year are our paste tomatoes. Uh, these again are for mostly for canning, for making tomato uh, paste, tomato sauce, uh, all of those things that we need these for. We're doing two varieties this year. We're On this end, we're doing the opalka. We grew these last year and we absolutely love them. The other end is a hybrid called La Roma. They're supposed to be a very good paste tomato as well. Uh, we're kind of taking our chance on doing a whole half a row of a new variety this year, but it came so highly recommended that uh, it looks like it's going to be a great. Now the paste tomatoes always to us seem to grow a little bit slower. You'll notice the plants aren't quite as big yet as the uh, slicing tomatoes, but they'll catch up and they're gonna do just fine. The other thing is this year, we had so much rain early in the spring, uh, like 10 inches of rain in less than a couple weeks, so that all of our plants were just late getting in the ground because we just couldn't get out here to plant. So uh, everything is probably two or three weeks behind what they have been in past years, but uh, I think they're gonna catch up and they're gonna do just fine. Our third row of tomatoes this year is a variety of all different kinds. The first half of row is a variety of five different types of cherry tomatoes. Uh, we're growing these a lot just for us to eat, but also to sell at the farmer's market. Uh, we've got, uh, again, all different colors, all different varieties, and they're doing really well. We've actually gotten a couple to pick already, and it looks like there's gonna be more to pick today. The second half of this last row is a variety of different tomatoes that we've never really grown before. Uh, we have some Lemon Boys, we have the Amish Paste, the Cherokee Purple, and we are so excited about these, uh, especially the Amish Paste. This is one we're really curious about. We tried them when we lived in Arizona and they just didn't do well there, but they were so highly recommended to us by Danny and Wanda, our friends over at Deep South Homestead, that we had to give them a second chance now that we're in a completely different climate. And I can tell you, they are looking amazing. Uh, there's a very good chance that these will replace one of the paste tomatoes in our main paste tomato row next year uh, because they're just looking that good. So we are excited about that. Uh, thank you, Danny and Wanda, for pushing us to trying them again because they are looking awesome. The very last row of the garden is split in half. And this half over here are the edamame, which are soybeans. And they are doing well. All the beans in the garden are doing super. So it doesn't surprise me that the edamame is doing well also. Now this variety of edamame, it's from Baker Creek and it is not a GMO soybean. And these type are grown for fresh eating. Once you pick them, you steam them, and then you just eat them right out of the bean pod. We're excited to try these. They're the first time we're growing them on our homestead, but we do enjoy them. So the second half of this row is a complete failure. We only have one plant out of all of these empty holes 
that is actually growing. This is where we're supposed to be growing our cucumbers. The last two years, we have grown so many cucumbers that we would fill buckets and buckets of them and take them to the pigs. So many cucumbers that the pigs wouldn't even eat cucumbers anymore. This year, right now, we have one living plant. We really think those pesky cucumber beetles and the squash beetles got at these guys. Uh, I have put diatomaceous earth on top of the one last standing cucumber plant, but we've also gone ahead and replanted seeds in every hole. Last year, our pigs planted us a fall garden filled with cucumber plants, so I'm not that worried that there's not enough time. In southern Missouri, we have a long enough growing season that I think that we'll be able to pull it off. But we just really need, everybody needs fresh cucumbers right from the garden, right? So we're going to give it a try. But things aren't always perfect on our homestead either. We've had some real struggles in the garden so far this summer. And we want to talk with you guys about it and share our struggles with you. But it is so hot, we need to move to the shade. Well, we found a nice shady spot to sit and talk to you guys for a couple minutes. You know, this year we've really had some crazy weather here in the Ozarks. We've had so much rain and then intermittent cold and extreme heat. And it's just been a crazy start to the growing season. It's really affected our garden and our garden is, is suffering in a few different ways. And we wanted to talk with you guys about that. And we've really noticed over the last week because we've been going to check on the garden so much more now that the cherry tomatoes are actually starting to come on a little bit. Uh, we're, we're going out there more so we can pick everything and bring it in the house to eat them. It's weird. When Sarah goes to look at the cherry tomatoes, she comes in with a nice big handful. But whenever I go and check them, <laughs> I come back in and there's none at all. It's really weird. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, so we wanted to talk with you about a few things that have been really bothering the garden and really what we're going to do about it. And the first thing is, overall, we're really battling caterpillars. Yeah. I think uh, every kind of plant we have out there right now is getting eaten by caterpillars. Right. Uh, especially, I think, the, I think they're army worms. Um, they're, and they, yeah, they're just devastating everything right now. Luckily, the worms are still very, very small at this point. Uh, we caught them early, but there are a ton of them. And then in the matter of two days, I pulled off six tomato hornworms from the tomatoes. Actually, some were on the uh, green or the pepper plants and some were on the tomatoes. Um, some were just like huge yeah. and like plump and nasty. But I also found a teeny tiny one. So I feel like that those tomato hornworms are just starting to ramp up. So we decided to, you know, put the kibosh on all of those caterpillars and we used an organic bacteria that you can spray on your plants that the caterpillars ingest and then they die. And it's called BT. Right. It, we've used it in the past. It is very effective for caterpillars. Uh, it doesn't work for anything else. It doesn't take care of squash bugs or anything like that. Uh, but for caterpillars, if you're having a problem with those, the BT will take care of them in no time. Basically what they do is they, it, it soaks into the leaf and then when the caterpillar eats the leaf, the bacteria gets inside of the caterpillar and kills it. Yeah. The other insects that are really bothering the garden right now, and really more specifically the tomato plants, are the white flies and the aphids. They're not to the point right now that they're affecting or killing the tomato no. plants. They're just on there kind of waiting for the plants to become weaker than they are right now. Uh, so we need to do something about that. Uh, neem oil and combined with Dr. Bronner's uh, sal suds, that combination sprayed on them, that should be fine. But the biggest threat right now to the tomatoes anyway um, is that disease, that fungus that we're seeing starting. Right, yeah, it really was affecting some of the tomatoes, especially those jet setters. I don't know why it's affecting those more than the others, but it, it really was affecting almost all of the tomatoes. Uh, so tonight, 
after it cools down, we're going to be spraying them with a hydrogen peroxide spray, uh, and that should help. It won't eliminate uh, the fungus from all of the plants, but it will help protect the new leaves, the leaves that don't have them on yet. It will protect the new leaves from getting that on. And we'll probably have to continue spraying that on once a week or so throughout the growing season just to help protect any new leaves before they get it. Initially what we're going to do is spray several days in a row just to make sure the plants are really covered well and that they get a good start at healing from the, um, the fungus, whichever one it is. You know, some of those are really hard. The, uh, the funguses are hard to determine which kind it is because a lot of them all look the same. Uh, so anyway, we will spray those several days in a row and then like Kevin said, we'll do about once a week. Right. And all we're going to be using is just standard hydrogen peroxide from the store that you get in the pharmacy. And it's uh, 8 to 12 tablespoons of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water in a sprayer. So, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide is super cheap. It's a good way to uh, take care of the plants without having to spend a lot of money. And then the last uh, bug that's affecting the garden this year, again, is squash bugs. We really thought maybe this year would be better because... We started an entirely new garden area where we haven't grown any squash type plants before. Uh, it's pretty far away from where we were last year and you know they just found them within a matter of days. It seems to be mostly on our cantaloupe right now, a couple on the watermelon plants, um, but on the cantaloupe, I mean the cantaloupe seemed to be attracting the squash bugs and the cucumber beetles yeah. and so uh, hopefully the diatomaceous earth will take care of that. We're just not uh, open to using anything more harsh than that. So um, we'll just hope for the best that they survive. Well, the diatomaceous earth is easy for us to use right now because our plants are small. Uh, but like on the big squash plants and, and also as these uh, cantaloupe and watermelon plants get big, it's like it's hard to put diatomaceous earth on a huge area and all these plants. So at some point we're just gonna have to, you know, pray and, and hope for the best. So there you go. Uh, not everything is always perfect on the homestead. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, pests just come up or problems start that, uh, you know, if you're not on top of right away, uh, they can turn into much bigger problems. We've been busy this last week and haven't had as much time as we'd like in the garden but hopefully that will be calming back down here soon and we'll be able to spend more time out there. I don't think any of the problems that we're having right now are so far out of control that they're going to affect things long term uh, as long as we stay on top of it from here on out. So you guys, thanks so much for joining us in the garden today and listening to all of our gardening woes for the summer. Uh, we appreciate you stopping by. We'd love it if you would subscribe to our channel if you haven't already and share it with your friends and family. Until next time, thanks so much for stopping by the homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.